Jesus or nothing is the religious binary that most of our people accept. Christian or irreligious is perhaps a nicer way of putting it. That false dichotomy is understandable to an extent. Either you subscribe to the faith of our more recent forefathers, or you throw out the baby Jesus with the bathwater, concluding that the whole concept of an omniscient, omnipotent, celestial supreme being is hokum. But there is a third way, one in keeping with our glorious history and also true to our people. And we're delighted to welcome a representative of the Asatru Folk Assembly on this week to dig into their faith, their project, and good deeds in a fallen world. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to have our, have our guest on here. So we'll move on to him with that. Our very special and very patient guest, he is, pardon me here, I'm going to give it the best shot I can, the Alshur Jagathi of the Asatru Folk Assembly, a very white-friendly pagan or Volkish faith. We'll get into what exactly it is and the proper ways to describe it, but I can't wait to dig into that. Matthew Flavel, welcome to Full House, sir, under Davion. Hey, guys, thank you very much for having me. You bet. Uh Gave you some questions in advance. Sam and Smasher are going to pepper you. Our objective here is to learn as much as possible about what you guys believe in and what you're doing. Uh, I know you got a big network already and you've been around for a while, but I'm sure a ton of our listeners either have uh, preconceived notions about what it is or perhaps, like myself, are, are largely ignorant. So uh, we're just going to get into all of it and get to it. But of course, your first time on Full House, and we always ask first-time guests, uh, what's your ethnicity and your fatherhood status? Religion is going to come uh, throughout the course of the show. Um, white man, I think, getting more specific, most of my people are from England. Uh, most recent uh, folks that came over to the New World are from France and Switzerland. All right. And yet you married, have kids? Uh, yeah, I am married, and I have a beautiful little baby girl that's 17 months old now. Oh, man. Awesome. Congratulations. You, you looking to have more? Um, we'll see. My wife and I didn't know if it'd really be in the cards for us. We both kind of waited too long in life. We're, uh, both yep. of us are 40 now, so we're really happy we were able to, to have her. And you know, but We'd love to have some more, but we'll, we'll yeah, see how that goes. Some. Sure thing. Totally understand. Yeah, 40 gang here as well, sir. So, uh, Godspeed to you. I, I hope you do have more, but hey, you got Me that too. one precious babe. Yeah, exactly. Count your blessings. And uh, what were you raised religiously? We, we know you're probably something different now, or maybe... Yeah. Well, I wasn't. I think in the most broad possible sense, I guess, culturally Protestant Christian, just because my parents had to put something down on a piece of paper, but sure. it wasn't really a very active part of my, my upbringing that way. So you came to your current faith uh, around when in life? Um, so I had a, a brief period. I, I've always been a, a person with a with a spiritual need and uh, didn't really know my options. So I, my aunt uh, was a very active Jehovah's Witness. I, I say was. I assume she still is a very active Jehovah's Witness. And I got involved with that for you know a couple of years at, towards the end of high school. I found Ausatru in let's say 2001. Okay. How'd you find it? Um, so I, uh, I tried really hard with, with Christianity. I, I tried, you know, I read my Bible through, I think three different times, cover to cover to try to get, you know, try to force the square peg into the round hole. And, mm -hmm. uh, I came to the conclusion that the biblical God wasn't, <clears throat> So I think person's a strange word to use, but just wasn't a very good person in my understanding of that. And I wanted mm -hmm. to separate from it. It was very scary because I didn't know what the other options were. Right. But, you know, as a historically minded person, I know that our people had, you know, had religion before Jesus came, you know, from the Middle East to Europe. So I, I looked back into what that was and I thought I was going to be the only, you know, weirdo out there doing this, but I was, mm -hmm. I had, uh, you know, Googled it at the time just to find out. I was thinking I'd get some historical information from historical sources. And I, I found this thing called the Astro Folk Assembly and Steve McNallan. And I saw, you know, regular folks that were practicing this faith, you know, right now. Sure. And it was fascinating. And once I got hooked, I've, I've never really let go. Um, it, 
it was a uh, it we always say in the afa it's like coming home that's one of our catchphrases or whatever but it really is that it absolutely felt like coming home and a lot of our members describe that as well fair enough um and before we get on to the faith itself your position Alshur Jargathi, apologies for the pronunciation. Oh, what, what is that? Is that is that like a, a high priest, or are you the top dog? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. All right. <laughs> Simply yes. Now the the word itself, Alshur Jargathi. So it basically means like Alls Haryar Haryar meaning warrior, and so like every warrior's Gothi, and Gothi means like God man. It's from the same root as the Goths. Um, gothic and mm -hmm. god for that matter all right very cool so my conception of afa is pagan the old gods uh odin and thor and i i always wondered whether it was more of a cultural movement or whether uh your your flock your members were, were true believers actually believe in the divinity of those uh you know very ancient and historic beliefs that that so many of our ancestors uh, held. So now's your chance to descri describe it in your own words. Uh, I'm sure some of our Christian listeners will maybe get a little bit triggered, so <laughs> bear with us, folks. We're trying to get uh, the, the straight dope from, from the chieftain himself. So go ahead. Have at it, Matt. What do you guys believe in and why? Well, so I can't, I can't promise you that every member of the Astro Folk Assembly has a deep and sincere faith. I hope that they're on the road to that. I can certainly say our leadership, myself very much included, without a doubt, believe completely in the existence and reality of our gods and in the relationship that we have built and are building with them. Um, I think it's very easy for people who don't, who haven't been raised with that and haven't had experiences that way to picture our gods in these very, you know, comic book, fairy tale images sure and there's so much more to it than that i don't believe that thor is you know a big buff dude with a red beard driving a goat chair <laughs> i think that that image tells me about the great divinity that is thor yep. it helps me wrap my head around it but our gods are so much more than you know the the images and, and myths of our ancestors they're they're the supreme forces of, of consciousness of our of our folk of our race and, and through ritual and interaction i absolutely have seen the reality of them in my own life and in the life of the astro folk assembly oh man how would cool. you or how, how do you feel about uh the concept that you know particularly in pagan religions that there is some sort of ancestral hero that then became part of our mythology um, I think, I think that's an easy way for people to have their cake and eat it too and try to rationalize things that don't fit neatly in what they typically can rationalize or what they can touch. Uh, I don't preclude the idea of a hero apotheosing and becoming, becoming more and ascending to something, you know, like a lesser, lesser G godhood. But I certainly don't think that's the root of, of all of the great gods of, you know, Aryan creation. Hmm. And when you mention the gods, Matt, uh, which ones are you referring to? I, I don't know if there's a thousand of them or if we're just talking about the big ones. But uh, give us a little more information on the, uh, yeah, the pantheon itself. Well, so in the Astro Folk Assembly, we, we worship our gods under the, you know, I guess the Norse names for our gods, the old Norse names. Um, the what you would think of as those very specific divinities goes back much, much older than that to, you know, Neolithic times, to glacial times, to Hyperborea. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's a common thread and a common face of some of this godhood to all Indo-European or Aryan religions. And I think mm -hmm. that they're expressed a very specific way in... Uh, germanic nations and by the time we got really in-depth writing on it in the uh, in the nordic countries mm -hmm. all right well and that's uh, if you look if across the uh, uh different groups different uh pantheons you know you have a lot of the same stories with mm -hmm. just different uh different proper nouns applied to them 
absolutely as our people migrated our stories and our the way that specific groups of our people related to our gods became different over thousands of years but this is a very ancient aryan faith that i think is common to all of our folk what uh, would you describe it what's the most succinct way to describe it pagan folk folkish <laughs> yeah, I'd go with the folkish pagan. Absolutely, it meets the dictionary definition, but that's got so many trappings of degeneracy in today's world that you know we we have very little in common with. If you just searched for pagan groups, um, those people right. and us have very few things in common. Sure, and that's something that I think people probably assume, right? That this you guys are like in costumes and weirdos and neckbeards, and <laughs> I hope they don't assume that. I've tried every way I know how to break that assumption, and I continue to try. I hope they don't think that, but I'm sure some folks, without a you know a context for it, probably do start that way, thinking that. Very good. Uh, and where would you point people who want to learn more about this? You have a website. Is there a uh, a one old Norse holy book that is that is primary? Um, no, I mean, the prose and, pose- and poetic eddas are certainly a really rich source for the, the high points of our lore, but I think that it encompasses the, the traditions of our folk back to the beginning. There's a lot of history and archaeology involved to getting a well-rounded view, but to understand the modern uh, religion of Ausatru, I'd say go to our website, www.runestone.com. Dot org, right. and also check us out on YouTube. Um, we're still on YouTube, and uh, we've got a lot of followers there, and we we've got quite a bit of content there that goes a little bit more in depth. Mm-hmm. And you guys are recognized, you know, not that we care whether the government recognizes it or not, but you have won, uh, I, I don't, were it court battles or did you have to struggle to gain legitimacy from people, you know, against people who either thought it was racist or uh, sort of a front, you know, just a way to be racially exclusionary? No, I mean, folks don't necessarily like it, but we've always been treated fairly in that regard by the government. We got our uh, 501c3 acknowledgement from the irs in 1995 all right um so we've been around for 27 years now just about all right and you have you have flock all over the country but you have a few uh you call them hoffs right not churches or parishes yeah yeah hoffs basically a, a house of worship and we have um three of those we're actually well underway to getting our fourth one at present all right and what is, I guess if you had to boil it all down, is your, it's a, it's a religion, it's a faith. Uh, so it's obviously about connecting people to something higher, something greater. But I, I assume it's also very cultural and that your uh, fellow faithful view themselves as a family of sorts. Is that fair? Absolutely. Um, the, the family aspect of it is is extremely important and Again, it's not just kind of something we say. It's really something you feel when you when you get together with other AFA members. Uh, it's certainly something that that I feel, and you know that's certainly what we aim for. It's it's absolutely cultural, but what we really want to get away from is a tendency that we've seen out there in in other faiths of it being you know just something they do on Sunday. Also, true should affect who you are throughout all of your life, not just when you're in ritual or, or at a religious event. And how about some of those, you know, when you think Christianity, you think the the Ten Commandments as a moral guidepost. So what are some of yours? Do you have a a golden rule and that sort of thing? The uh, essential practices for someone who's in your faith. Um, As far as a set of rules, um, much less thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that. Mm Mm-hmm. What we have is the nine noble virtues, and we've, we've got much more than that, but these are kind of nine concepts that encapsulate a lot of what it means to, to live true in Ausa True. And those are uh, courage, discipline, fidelity, honor, hospitality, industriousness, perseverance, self-reliance, truth, And in the AFA, we believe in a 10th noble virtue of victory. All right. (laughs) Very good. I like it. Uh, Now, I'm I'm sure that a lot of guys 
or and gals listening to this would be like, this all sounds great, but I can't see myself sincerely believing in Odin or Thor or the old gods. Would those people, uh, would they be sort of like auxiliaries? Could they be friends with your flock, but not real members? Uh, what's, what's that dynamic like? Um, a lot of people start there. Uh, I think a lot of our folks start there. It's we got got kind of two dynamics now, and it was different years ago. But now, you know, there's there's the people that come to Alistair True from Christianity, but there's a lot of people who come to Alistair True from uh, atheism or at the very least agnosticism, to where they, they don't have they're not people of faith before they become Alistair True. Spiritual, not religious. A lot of people like to say that, and I think that's just people being non-committal. Um, one yeah, thing no, that's I agree. really what we would ask before you join the AFA is that you open yourself to it. I don't expect you to be the most devout follower of the gods when you haven't built that relationship. It's very much about building relationships. But what I've always seen is when people come and they, they're open to it, when they reach out and say, hey, if you guys are here, I'm listening. Um, let's go. I've been, one of the most beautiful things I've seen as a Gothi is that moment when it becomes real to someone and you can see it in their eyes. Um, when you do a ritual and, and it doesn't hit everybody at the same time, but even people who think they believe you can catch that moment when like, Oh wow, this you know, it's like when you go hunting, every stump is is what you're hunting for until you see the animal, and then you wonder how you could have hmm. been so easily fooled before. When they see it, and they're like, oh, okay, this is real. Sure. That's really so, yeah, a special can, thing. Yeah. Can we circle back to the nine noble virtues? Of course. Um, so there's what the Odinic right that is, it's a similar set of uh, rules, I guess, right? And how do you, how do you feel about them? Do you guys use those? Well, so the, the nine noble virtues is kind of a commonly agreed upon up until there's some lefties very recently that take issue with it, which makes it even better. Um, yeah, the, the nine noble virtues have been kind of agreed upon by most uh, Alistair True organizations, like I said, until very recently. Um, certainly, I, th I believe they were developed in large part by uh, Stoba in in the Odenic right um yeah so those lists are very very similar i think there's some people that have them in a slightly different order but that's pretty much common across the board in the history of modern house true smasher we were talking before we hit the record button and i, I figured that this was up his alley and, and indeed it was smasher was there anything that uh you know you, you're not a member of course but is was there anything that turned you off or gave you pause or are you still uh interested and it's just a question of when not if it's a question of when not if uh the biggest challenge i think for pagan uh or Asatru curious people would be you don't grow up with any you know knowledge of you know any of the old faiths basically you learn some really surface level garbage or you get uh, like the Marvel DC version of you know Thor and so you have this you know basically you get this huge uh barrier to entry because it's all these foreign or seemingly foreign words and you don't understand any of it uh maybe you grew up in the church and even if you aren't in the church any longer it's like you still you know all of this stuff about christianity uh culturally i mean we're not really christian but we're still kind of you know culturally christian in a way sure. uh, at least from a knowledge base i think people you know just know a lot more about christianity than they do about any type of uh, sure. pagan or old faith um so that was i guess a bit of a barrier to entry uh and i mean i've read and i'm certainly better than like i was years ago when i first heard about the afa uh, but for me it's mostly been a time thing where it's just like I was in the army and didn't have any time. Uh, then I had a set of twins and didn't have any time. And now I have another set of twins. <laughs> uh, but we recently met uh, someone in the AFA. And so having somebody local to you kind of makes access a little easier. 
and sure. hopefully we can jump start jump start that yeah i'm I'm sincerely curious about it obviously it's not on my to-do list yet but uh i'm leaving that door open to be candid now sam on the other hand said that these are all a bunch of heretics who deserve to be burned (laughs) at stake before before we record it that's true true. (laughs) but yes sam what are you thinking about this does this make you uncomfortable do you respect it grudgingly what's your take on all this uh, no, no. Um, yeah, as the resident Christian on this show, I, I have been waiting to chime in, waiting for the right moment. Um, <laughs> sure. You know, this. if you uh, read the New Testament, this uh, very thing be- was a, a controversy because Christ said, oh, do you not realize that, that the scriptures say ye are gods, you know? And so this thing of uh, honoring the ancestors and... Um, you know, the gods, so to speak, small g gods. Uh, this is in the Bible. It's in our faith. And uh, <clears throat> I was just at a beautiful wedding uh, over this last weekend. One of our uh, dear comrades locally here was married and <clears throat> was officiated by an AFA guy. I'm not going to say his name on the air. Uh, and maybe we could talk a little more about that uh, later. But um, you know, he, he hearkened to that in his remarks about uh, the ancestors and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think anybody have, could have a problem with that. But um, as the resident Christian here, I would like to, to comment on this, you know, for the sake of, of the Christians or for the sake of anybody, I guess, who's listening. But, uh, you know, um, in, in the scriptures, in our New Testament, it says, be a doer of the word and not just an ineffectual hearer. And I have had a lot of experience through the years with these um, Asatru or pagan types. And these are people, I don't know Matt extremely well, but uh, I, I have the idea that if we sat and talked, just like I sat and talked with this uh, man that was officiating the wedding, we're on the same page. We have the same morals. You know, as a Christian, whether this person exactly agrees with the things I believe in, the thing is, he's living to the things I believe in, and he's doing the things I believe in. So mm-hmm. in that way, if you're a Christian and you, and you are wondering about this, look at it in that respect that... Uh, you know, our people have the law written in their heart, and so we we uh, have this inclination to to be a certain way. And and uh, Matt and and his people, they have that same inclination to be that way. Uh, so that's the way I would put it. As, as far as a question to Matt, uh, you know, for sp- just speaking for myself, I am a unabashed white nationalist, and. Uh, I don't know if the does the AFA take a very explicit position like we are for white people per se, or 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 do you express it more in this these spiritual terms, you know, uh, uh, affirming these ideas about uh, Odin and these different different characters and things like that? Um, I don't know. Can you can you say just a little bit about that? How, how explicitly white nationalists argue. Come yeah, and if I say. and if I could piggyback off that real quick too, Sam. Yeah, I mean, uh, at least in the news and in what the enemy describes you as, you know, of course you're you're terrible, horrible, sure. racial, yeah. racially <laughs> exclusionary, you know, what, what budding or crypto white supremacist. But it, but it does sound like you are you got away with this is a faith for people of European descent. So yeah, talk talk about race and AFA if you would. Matt. Well, we didn't get away with anything because we're not doing anything wrong. It's absolutely <laughs> an ethnic go. faith, and it's absolutely just for white people and we put that in our uh, in our um, a declaration of purpose and in our statement of ethics to where it's clear um, it's an ethnic faith in the same way that many Native American faiths are ethnic faiths yeah honestly most religions that aren't Abrahamic in origin are ethnically based and ethnically sure. exclusive and so in that sense absolutely now, as far as nationalism goes, well, we're, a, we're an international uh, church. We have members around the world. 
and we're a religion and not a political movement. So, you know, I don't know if I'd throw that on it, but we are certainly uh, for our folk, which we define as white people. Sure. And now, how about, I'm not trying to be cute here, what about Southern Meds or uh, those from the Levant? Uh, I assume that not, you know, not all Europeans believed in Odin and the Old Norse gods. So uh, how, how do you square that circle? Yeah. You know, I, I think that all Europeans believed in Indo-European slash Aryan divinity. And I think mm -hmm. that that takes certainly as you branch out from northern and central europe that starts looking quite a bit different it ends right. up looking different in the mediterranean and i think that the racial makeup there tends to look a little bit different too for a similar reason um but we're absolutely pan-aryan and the people that join the afa we have italians we have spaniards um okay. the reason that we use white isn't to be provocative it's because in the united states it has a meaning um sure absolutely you know, there was a time where we, you know, were much more cautious and talking about ethnically European and this and that. But Barack Obama is ethnically European, and oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right, oh, yeah, yeah, really, yeah, yeah. All right, so well, yeah, yeah, what, and, what, and what, I, I don't say that rudely, but you got a lot of people at the time who were genuinely confused. They're like, "Well, if I'm half German and half sure. Nigerian, no. why, why couldn't I join if it's for ethnic Europeans?" Okay. And when you go and you fill out a job application or any kind of a survey in the United States, you know what box you check. Right. And so do you, that's, do, that's you have a, take it. do you have the, a hard and fast rule, not, not a drop of non-white blood? Or, you no, know, we, we basically argument. have that job application rule. If, you're, if you look like the rest of us and you identify as the rest of us, then, then we're fine. I'm not into sure. rooting into anybody's family tree or whatever, but by mm -hmm. that same token, and I'll say this for anybody thinking about joining, um, you know, if you're Elizabeth Warren and you're 100% white, but you want to <laughs> identify as something else, that hurts right. our group cohesion. It hurts what we're all gathered together to do and to celebrate, so we wouldn't allow her to be a member for that reason. Sure. Well, the reason I brought that up was because, and, and you already addressed it, but I, I wanted to underscore that this word pagan, um, you know, like you, like if, if I put up a flyer in my town here and I said, hey, pagan festival next weekend or something like that, you know what kind of weirdos would show up, <laughs> yes. you know, <laughs> so that's you know so potato I'm smasher you, yep yeah. i was i was <laughs> using me I chose. Yeah. <laughs> so i'm glad you drew that distinction because you know like it in a way like i've i've met enough people where somebody's using that word that moniker pagan okay well i talk to them enough and i see okay all right we're on the same page here it's fine you know but i i think that's important to to understand like for somebody who's approaching this they think oh yeah pagan i'm gonna jump on that you know let me tell you if you go attend something and it's being described as a pagan thing you're not going to want to be there i don't think you wanted to yeah. start out Start out as a pagan, and next thing you knew, you were a homosexual. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're literally going to see like dreadlocks, pot smoking. No, that that sounds that sounds like a joke, but no, I bet you that the majority of that pagan festival, the theoretical pagan festival, is probably <laughs> they're probably like wearing Gabe some kind of costumes. It may yeah, not yeah. be a furry costume, and it's very <laughs> disproportionately homosexual. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, the, the same, the same oh, people God. that are going to the uh, pagan festival are the same people that would go to like the libertarian kid rape park. Well, this is something that I wanted to kind of mention that that I think is important. Um, one of the things that drew me to the Austro Folk Assembly specifically, and that I'm very proud of about us, is we define ourselves positively. We're not. Also true because of how not Christian we are. We're also true because of our positive faith in our gods and our celebration of our folk. Um, a lot of people who are under the you know the pagan and I'm doing the little air quotes uh, banner. Mm -hmm. They're pagan because they're not Christian or they're not this or they're nonconformist generally. So they've decided to put you know a, a special label on it. But they're, they're atheists there because of that a lack like of faith. they're atheists that like Marvel. 
Yeah, or that like just Renaissance Fair stuff. Yeah. Um, well, Smasher, yeah. I got to stop you there. You're you're keep mentioning Marvel and comic books. I am a comic book guy, but I just wanted to quickly say there's a series going on right now. It's called Norse Mythology. Uh, it's a Neil Gaiman uh, produced thing. It's on Image Comics, and uh, it's actually really good. It's like a very straight telling of the nordic myths so uh check it out you know if if somebody's out there and they're in, into comics sure thing uh matt tell us a little bit about the uh the vi I, I gotta ask you had a vision of the gods but uh before that where did the where do the roman and greek gods fall into the picture are they considered sort of like uh ancillary or relatives of the old norse gods what's up with that and then talk about the vision that you had so that's that's the murkier one and it's kind of difficult if you said are the celtic gods the same i'd say yes are the slavic gods the same i'd say sort of when you start getting the overlap in divinity functions and personality is very different in greco-roman religion mm -hmm. and I think it cheapens that to say it's exactly the same, but I do believe they're drawing on the same sources of divinity okay. uh, presented in a different way. And it's presumptuous to say that, you know, our version of it is the correct version and their version of it's wrong. What I will say is any modern attempt at reviving that faith that I've seen tends to immediately go to the gay Bacchic orgy and mm -hmm. not go to higher, you know, they're not worshiping, you know, Jupiter Optimus Maximus. They're they're going into immediately into the, the license for degeneracy. And I've seen a lot of that, unfortunately, which makes it very hard for the people that are very sincere. I've seen the same thing with um, modern attempts to revive uh, the Celtic faith. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage those folks to come be part of the AFA. It gets it it gets you to where you're trying to go. It reconnects you with your ancient, you know, Aryan spirituality. That's the the true faith of our people. Sure. And I guess before the the vision, tell us what a uh, you know, for lack of a better term, a mass or a, a ceremony, you know, an assembly of your faithful looks like. And then I assume that your vision was maybe perhaps part of some ceremony. I don't know how much of this stuff is you know secret in house or what you can share with the audience to get to give them a taste. And, uh, yeah, uh, I'm, a, I'm a pretty open book on it. Um, so usually most of, most of our events that we do because we there's a distance factor you know we'll have people to our homes or whatever but to go to one of our hoffs a lot of people have to commute a little way so we make a day out of it um we spend a lot of that day just in fellowship getting to know people making friends um doing any work that needs to be done on the on the hoff or the grounds preparing a meal together um that's something that you know can be a very important community building fact of our faith is we do base a lot of the things we do around around mealtime around sharing a feast together so sometimes the ladies will be in the kitchen helping prepare that or the guys will be out by the grill that's a cool bonding time but it's a lot of time just you know getting to know each other we often have um little classes or discussions on various topics that are relevant to the reason that we're there um our main religious ritual of the day is called a bloat i think that's the closest thing to a mass that that we do and it's um trying to describe it depends where you're at whether you're outside or you're inside but in general we do that in a in a circular formation um we, we do things sunwise so you go into the circle and sunwise or clockwise um do all your movements that way <sighs> The point of the bloat is to connect the folk with the gods and vice versa, the gods with the folk. And as the officiant of that ceremony, the Gothi, um, that's really a lot of, of what you do. And it depends on the purpose. Let's say we're at Odin's Hof and we're doing an Odin bloat. Um, the Gothi would go into the, into the circle. Usually we have a fire in the middle. Um, yeah. And he would, uh, invite the gods to to witness what we were doing to be there to join us uh he would invite the ancestors to watch what we're doing and to celebrate with us and he'd often invite the spirits of the land the spirits of, of that location to to witness what we we're doing okay um at that point 
you usually invoke whatever deity you're honoring and say your piece. Um, it's really important to me that you address the God you're talking to and don't just look at the people and talk to them about the gods. And during bloat, you're communicating directly with divinity, uh, at least if you do it right. So um, the Gothiel will talk to the God, uh, speak for the group to the God. And then the main, the main portion with most everything we do is, a, is kind of a form of a communion. It's a sharing. It's a gifting cycle. So we'll take a horn, usually filled with mead that our ladies bless and prepare for us. And we'll walk around the circle and you'll, you'll pour your energy into that horn. You'll you touch the horn and imbue that with, with your feelings of, of worship, of loyalty, of, of commitment to whatever God we're celebrating. We'll do that in a circle. And then we'll uh, pour out that horn in offering. And then I'll raise a horn and I'll, I'll ask that, that if, if that God, if, you know, we use the Odin example, if Odin hears us and, you know, accepts our offering and sees what's in our heart and is pleased to uh, pour out his blessings on us. And so I'll hold the horn up until I feel like we have received those blessings. And then we'll distribute it around the circle. And it depends. You know, when I first started out, everybody's drinking out of the horn and it's all good at this point. If you get, you know, at our midsummer, we had 150 people. So we'll often a spurge with the mead and uh, usually an evergreen sprig to distribute it amongst uh, amongst the folk. All right. Um, we'll do that. And then uh, that's usually the conclusion. We will usually thank the God and uh, thank folks for, for joining us. And people will leave the circle and go out and reflect on it. That's right. the most simple. I mean, sometimes we'll offer sure. different things if there's a... You know, if there's a particular meaning to, um, usually at Yule we'll offer like a like a straw Yule bock that we make, um, so a sun wheel very often at uh, at midsummer. All right, and tell us about the. Did you have a vision during one of these uh, bloats or assemblies, or was it a more personal thing? Um, well, I think I think a vision is kind of a big word for it. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think of the best way to describe. It. I've had a couple of really really profound experiences and it's it's hard to say one of the things that people will notice will be certain things um happening at happening at auspicious times you'll have animal signs um there'll be a a particular point of emphasis in your bloat and all of a sudden a raven will call from a tree or an eagle will land or you know something that doesn't usually happen but happens at a really specific and important time or a gust of wind will make the fire rage when you when you want to make an emphasis um you'll see those things and those are always really special all of them sound very uh you know if you're not actually experiencing them they can sound like yeah whatever so the wind blew that's fine but if you're there it's really different and i'll tell you the most profound ritual experience i had um it was by a, a githia named patricia hall um who's no longer uh, with the astrofolk assembly but she she was doing a winter nights uh dc or bloat and that's where we invoke our female ancestors that watch over us and our families and at one part in the ritual, she was basically summoning those ancestors to be there with us. And she had us close our eyes and speak the names of one of our, our female ancestors that we that we connected with, or that we wanted to, to be there with in that circle. And uh, the most, uh, when I say that, um, when I say that my grandmother was with me in that circle, I'm not saying it as metaphor i'm not saying it symbolically i could feel what it felt like to to hug my grandma the last time i was able to i i, I could smell her it's very hard for this happened i don't know six years ago and it's very hard for me to this day to to recount it without tearing up because it was so powerful we had all these grown men leave the circle just crying like babies because they connected with with female ancestors that were important to them and it was really moving 
Um, I'll t- I think another time that I, I had a really profound experience, I had just become the Alzheimer's Gothi. Uh, our founder, Steve McNallan, had, had passed the torch to me, and I'd been doing it for a few months at this point. There was a lot of weight on my shoulders. There was a really big shoes to fill and a really big responsibility. And that was at Mostara event. And we were getting, and I didn't mention this, and I'll say more about it later if you're interested, but another one of our rituals we do is a ritual drinking rounds of toasts called the Sumble. So I was getting ready to to stand up and, and initiate that. And I was just really feeling the weight of my position and what I was doing. And, you know, there was a hand on my shoulder. So, you know, there's any number of people there who would have given me a reassuring hand on the shoulder, you know, shoulder grab, shoulder pat. And so I looked around, just kind of thank them because it was a cool thing to do. There was no one anywhere near me. But when I say there's a hand on my shoulder, I don't mean it felt like there was a hand on my shoulder or... It was as if, I mean, no, there was a hand on my shoulder. Um, I don't think those translate really well over podcast, but I can't, I can't get them out of my head. So, uh, but no, I, I was just saying, I believe you, buddy. And uh, I'm a supremely skeptical person, usually when it comes to the supernatural, to to ghosts and spirits and heaven and hell and all that stuff. But I'm 95% sure that I saw a ghost on my property. Just happened to coincide when Smasher was visiting once. I woke up uh, and camped out with the kids in a tent. Watch your uh, breathing there, Matt. You're a little hot on the on the phone. Uh, but I swore that I heard the sound of a extension ladder rattling off in the distance and, and Smasher and a couple other friends were over helping us out. And I was like, man, they, they're really getting going early. It was like right after sunrise. So I get up and look out and sure enough, off there in the distance, I see in the mist a vision of a man walking around with a extension ladder. So I get out of the tent, put my shoes on, go to look. Nobody there. Uh, I go up to the house to see if the guys are awake. Everybody's asleep. And it just so turns out that the man who built this house uh, here in Great Appalachia, where we live, uh, did, <coughs> excuse me, in fact, die in this house. So I think it's possible that, you know, his spirit or whatever was wandering around the, around the property that morning, hopefully in uh, sort of happiness or, or gladness that we're, we're doing honor to it and fixing it up. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe I was just seeing things in the morning in the mist, but well, I think I think fun. that's one of the good entry level things to to get people who are skeptical involved uh, with House of True is the worship of your ancestors. First, factually, you know they existed. There's no question that at least while they were here on Earth, they existed, or you would not be here. Um, to honor them is is only a positive, but in doing so and trying to connect with them, I find people have a very real, very visceral connection with that. And if you can believe that your ancestors look on from beyond the grave and, and hear with you in some way, mm-hmm. then it's that much easier to to accept, you know, the divinity. Sure. Uh, how about heaven and hell? Uh, Valhalla, is there, uh, if, if people fail to live up to your moral standards, do they go to hell? Um, no, I don't think so. I, I think there's something, you know, fundamentally off about believing there's a place of eternal torture. That's just kind of sadistic. Um, I, we do believe that at some point, if you, if you don't have worth, then you get, uh, basically disintegration you cease to be and your component parts go back into to making the next batch um, mm-hmm. i think that's what's described in our lore a lot about you know when the poison drips on when there's snakes that are dripping poison in uh, the strand in kind of our our unhappy underworld that's the idea of that is that disillusion and dissolving of that person that's of of very little or no worth or i guess of negative worth Mm -hmm. and how do you guys uh, yeah reboot reboot that soul um how do you guys handle obviously we are in a fallen world with rampant degeneracy either satanic or, or just jewish running wild all across the, the west, west. <laughs> very good special but uh i mean it's it's dark out there man uh do you find, are, are you growing are people coming to you looking for salvation from the sick society that we live in and uh yeah do you do you plan to combat it or is this more of just a we are doing right by our folk and the rest of the world be damned 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very so, good. It's a, so it's a multi-pronged approach. Yes, we have a lot of people who have come to us lately because things out there have gotten as bad as they have. Um mostly because values that we all were kind of agreed upon 20 years ago are completely foreign to the values that are in vogue now. And if you take that back a generation or two, it's, it's really shocking. Um, so we get a lot of people that come to us for what would normally be standard Western values. Um, the world is a, the, you're right. The world is degenerated in a lot of ways and there's a lot of, a lot of bad things out there. And I think it's very easy for us to gnash our teeth and, you know, shake our fist at it and be upset mm -hmm. about it. But in the AFA, we have an opportunity to fix things for each other, fix things for our folk. When last year, when everything was, you know, in full swing with the COVID lockdowns and people weren't going to their churches. And they, I mean, there's millions of Americans that couldn't gather together to worship their gods. During that time, we had our largest gathering ever at Midsummer. We got two new Hoffs during that year, and we spent that year together because we had our own properties in fellowship, worshiping our God, celebrating our folk, and we had that outlet where so many other people weren't lucky enough to have that. So we look for the opportunities we have. The state of the world gives us a tremendous opportunity to to do things and to make significant differences in the circles that we run in. And uh, yeah, if we can, you know, if we can change the whole world and get our folk going in a good direction, fantastic. If we can make things better for our families and our media community in the meantime, even better. Sure. If we can do yep. both. That's perfect. Exactly. Well, and I, I think, you know, without um, a guy, you know, some type of guide, you're going to be significantly more uh, negative in your in your outlook. You know, if you don't have uh, a worldview that kind of guides you to still good in this world of evil, like you're going to get locked in the sauce. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really important. And one of the things that I think is so, uh, at least was refreshing to me about Alsa True is it's about doing and about achievement. It's not about, you know, letting Jesus take the wheel or, or whatever the expression is where you give up and, and leave it to the gods. It's very much about taking action, being the hero and doing things and accomplishing and making your ancestors and your gods proud. And it really stri it really gives you a, a push to be all that you can be. How about, I'm, I'm sure that you attract some dubious characters or eccentrics. Have you? I assume you've had to kick people out for misbehavior or immoral activity. Obviously, I'm not looking to give you a, a bad rep or anything like that, but what, what would get somebody kicked out or have you had to uh, eject members? Uh, we have. Um, yeah. It... <laughs> You know, it, it depends. I'm trying to think of the most common the most common things that cause us to part ways with members. Uh, in general, as a church, we want to help people be better. So if people have struggles, you know, we we would prefer to keep them involved in the AFA and, and help them grow and help them fix whatever's wrong. Uh, we've thrown people out for deciding to pursue interracial relationships. Mm -hmm. um, that that'll that'll get you thrown out. Um, Good. No base station refuse. I'm <laughs> I'm sorry, you broke up there for a sec on my end. Oh no, base station waifu. No <laughs> negative. <laughs> no, no no body pillows. No yeah. <laughs> Watching anime, I I hope is certainly Smasher. You can't join. They're, they don't allow anime watchers. Hmm. Um, so another <laughs> an, another thing, and I'm trying to think of stuff. You, you mentioned how degenerate the world's getting. Um, there was one uh, person that we had to to part ways with who was passively allowing their daughter to transition as into pretending she was a man or whatever. Right. And in our view, that's child abuse, and we 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 couldn't allow yeah. that. Um. Those are the things, or if you do something unsafe, you know, we've had uh, members that will, will make women uncomfortable by being unsafe or will be violent towards women and families. And we are absolutely a family organization and the protection of our, our women and our families is, you know, 
one of our top priorities. So if you, if you become unsafe, we can't have you around. Sure. I assume abortion is a no, no. Um, so here's the thing. Uh, we don't have some kind of <laughs> universal no abortion stance. I think there's probably a lot of reasons that a family might choose that. Some of those being medical. We all have a different standard that way, but something that's happened out there in the world is, you know, used to be abortion was universally bad, but sometimes it was the better of two, two evils. Now it's celebrated like, yay, let's have more infanticide. And we want to stay as far away from that as possible. But there's, sure. there's health reasons and, and perhaps other things that may make that a thing. We try not to get in the family's business on that more than we need to. Sure. Uh, Matt, I just have uh, one or maybe two more questions here. We'll give Sam and Smasher a chance to chime in, too. We're already at an hour, I think. It's flown by. Go ahead, Smasher. I was just going to say, it's not illegal. It's just frowned upon. Fair enough. Uh, animal sacrifice. You guys killing goats and drinking their blood? Um, drinking their blood, no. I mean, I assume that most of us eat meat. And uh, we... <sighs> So animal sacrifice is not a, a big or a common part of Ausa True, but I can't say that people haven't practiced it. I mentioned earlier, though, that one of our big things is the community meal and the sharing. So every instance I know of a, an Ausa True sacrificing of, you know, a goat or a pig or whatnot has been to then prepare it for the folk to share it at a, at a ceremonial feast and dinner. Sure. So we get we slaughter livestock and eat it in that occasion makes sense yep and the, uh, the, the one big one that i wanted to ask here at the end not to uh, go on too long here sam, sam said uh coach i gotta i gotta pee no <laughs> sorry sam for calling you out i gotta go too uh regardless but uh, uh, you guys were you guys were in the news big time with the minnesota approval you got a you got a half approved there and there was much wailing and gnashing of teeth there. oh god you know a, a church that's only for white people if you read the press it was like another show and yet it wasn't quite uh as it seemed seemed from media depiction. So let us know what happened in uh, Minnesota, the status there. So I mean, the status, and then we'll kind of rewind. Everything's <laughs> fine. We've got a conditional use permit that is an automatic renewal unless we do something to significantly violate those terms, which are like, you know, have loud parties after 10 and become a nuisance to our community. No, everything's great. The people in the town have been very supportive of us in real life. Um, I know the media doesn't portray that. Uh, unfortunately, we got at when we first when we first got into town there, the media had gone out of their way to go to specifically Hispanic families. Mm -hmm. and to terrify them with what dangerous, evil people we are. <laughs> and that's, that's unconscionable. That's literally terrorism. They went out of their way to make these families scared to live in their community. Um, right. Many of those people are now our friends. They come by regularly. We do a food distribution to anybody in the community who's hungry. Um, frequently, the Hispanic families show up to that. Uh, at Church leaders in other towns send members of their congregation to come get fed if they're hungry because we do our food pantry there. Um, the neighbors have been great. People we've dealt with as far as inspectors and city people have been great. As far as I can tell, there's two people in that town that don't like us. They just have the loudest voice. There you go. Yep. And, uh, and, you're, and you're working on new Hoffs around the country. And that's really my final question here is, uh, well, a little editorializing here. I, I certainly hope that our Christian listeners are not offended by this conversation or think that we're trying to convert people away from Christianity and toward Asa True. But I would posit We've had plenty for, of pro-Christian episodes. Uh, oh, absolutely. 100%. Yeah, I'm just a little preemptive defensiveness here. But I would posit that for a lot of the guys out there who are irreligious or agnostic or atheist or, or most especially despondent and sort of lost in life, this sounds like something that would be absolutely a net positive for them. It's not just about them. It's what they can contribute to your community too. Uh, so I would certainly encourage them to consider it. And, uh, and what would you say to those 
you know, potential recruits out there, Matt, where you want them to go to runestone.org and anything else you would suggest? Yeah, go to runestone.org. Go check out our uh, YouTube presence. We got a lot of videos there that can help you feel comfortable. Reach out to your local folk builder. We have that on our contacts page at uh, runestone.org. They're a, kind of the local representative of the AFA. They'd be happy to answer any questions. You can always email me. I'll answer any questions. But yeah, I'd encourage you guys to come home. Give it a shot. You don't have to, you know, devote your entire life to the gods day one. I just think it's a good idea to open yourself up to it and see. Reach out. Amen. See who reaches back. Yep. Sam, you still want to uh, burn this guy at the cross? Or at the <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm well, yeah. like like I'm saying, like I said already, I think I said it enough, which is, uh, okay, you know, we have differences of belief and differences of the way we view things, but when it comes down to brass tacks, you know, the way we're living our lives, the things we stand for, the things we live day to day, you know, these these people have substantially, if not entirely, the same values at heart you know and so i would say look at it that way i've been around enough to deal with people who are atheists and pagans and you know this and that uh you know as white people we we have the law in our heart and and it's it's telling us to go a certain way and so so try to view it in that respect very good and and matt for somebody like me who likes what you guys are doing but is skeptical that i could come around to believing in in the old gods literally is it worth it for me to reach out or uh, should i just uh you know wish you guys well and, and and stay out absolutely it's worth it for you to reach out if you go with a bad attitude and you're certain that they don't exist then don't come around right but if you're you know if you're giving it a shot and you're not fully sold that's fine We'd love to have okay. you around and, and see if they, see if you can build that relationship. I'm confident you can. What uh, I'm bad at you guys' names. I'm sorry. With the gentleman who just spoke, the Christian gentleman, what he talked about having the law in your heart, what we refer to that as, and I also true, is our folk soul. That way of understanding how to be a good person is inherent to our ancestral folk soul that we all share, no matter what our belief mm -hmm. is. Right. As, as white sons and daughters of Europe, we share that. Right. Amen. Yep. I'd love to get some uh, spiritual connection to my ancestors, of course, especially the ones that I remember and are now gone. So, all right, Matt Flavel, head of the AFA. Thank you so much for coming on Full House, brother. You're, you're welcome to stay on in the second hour. You know, I know you got a little baby girl and, and life to go. So uh, it's up to you if you want to stick around or, or hit the road. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, I appreciate it. I'd love to, but I do got to get going here. Thank you so sure much thing. for having me on the program.